Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you day 610 of Russian war with Ukraine. As always, with former advisor to the office of the President of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel Alexei Rostovich, Yuri Romanenko, and Nikolai Feldman. Today brings, again, a lot of news for them to discuss. Of course, the focus is on Avdivka and situation there, new military aid from the Western Allies. The fact that Ukraine, despite fighting for freedom, is still remaining a somewhat tax hell, and what can be done about it as well as the fact that today it's much safer to be a corruptioner in Ukraine than to be a Rostovich trying to fight that. Also peculiar news coming from Russia, a channel general SVR, general of the military intel, tells about Putin's death and attempt for government takeover. How believable are these statements? And the Hamas delegation, of course, visiting Moscow. That and much, much more in today's stream. Buckle up, it'll be about an hour long. Thank you for your continuous support. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, dear members. With all this, let's deep dive into day 610. Enjoy. Hello everybody, this is Project Alpha, my name is Nikolai Feldman, and you're watching a War Diary with Alexei Rostovich and Yura Romanenko. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Hello. So, we are again, not in our usual Wednesday, but on Thursday, since, uh, yeah, we uh, previously came out on Tuesday. So let's start with Avdivka. This is the hottest topic. On one hand, it continues to cheer us with the number of losses that Russian army starts, suffers there. On the other hand, the threat of operative encirclement increases. And uh, we had a previous speaker here on the stream who also confirmed that uh, there is a definite threat of that happening. And did he, did he mention? Yeah, he did. He did say that on two occasions that it's time for us to withdraw heavy equipment. Meanwhile, the Institute for Study of War confirms that the Russian side has lost 109 armored vehicles of all kinds near Avdiivka, and uh, despite that, they continue to drop their reserves and to throw them into the fray, and they're still fighting for Avdiivka to take it over. And again, uh, Ukrainian side also came out and said that we should continue pouring our troops into Avdiivka as well, because it leads to serious losses on the Russian side. Alexei, how would you comment that situation? You mean, where's the priority? In the south or in Avdiivka? Yeah, something like that. Um, okay, so we probably would do not have enough forces to continue offensive campaign in the south. The numbers that we have, I don't think we have enough to solve our tasks in the south. I'm rather pessimistic there. I think even Tekmak will not be taken as a part of this autumn campaign. We'll probably have to prepare and take it in the next route. So, in the south, they have 55 different detachments, the type of regiment or brigade in the south. So, you can imagine how much resources we would need in order to continue the offensive campaign, the counteroffensive. We've been all the time advancing with a smaller force and a bigger force. So, it also is up to our general command, not to me. When are we taking Avdiivka or leaving Avdiivka? But I would warn our command to avoid the same pitfall of political statement when we start pouring into semi-fallen city additional troops who do not really change the situation much, they just die there, only to make a political statement. And there was always a, a time with uh, Bakhmut, with Solidar and other towns they've taken, when the number of losses actually started to equalize. And as your previous uh, speaker here, Artie Green, said that it's very important to not miss that crucial moment when your losses start to equalize with the opponent's losses. So it is important for us to not miss that step. And the second question would be, where are we withdrawing them to? Are we building any defense lines, any line number two, line number three in the West? We don't know of it. 
And if we follow the arrows on the long pincers motion, uh, if you look at the map, I, I'm not sure I'm using the right terms here. Yeah, let's call it uh, long pincers. Hey, is there something happening with the sound, Nikolai? Is uh, there is any suppression going on or what? Because you were disappearing, like half the sentence was gone. I don't think I don't think we are being suppressed. We're just rebooting my computer, and we'll bring the map right after when it restarts. So, Terracon and uh, Cox uh, chemical plant are being a points of interest on the map, and basically saying that Terracon is probably the most dangerous point. Also, if you look at the pincers and the direction where they're going to, it's very easy to understand their plan. Because the southern claw of pincers actually moved further, even beyond the level of our defense. And if they will break through in the north, then we'll have a lot of pain, a lot of grief near Avdiivka. Cox uh, chemical is a very important object in that area because it's a complex of rebar and concrete structures, which generally is a good cover and a good stronghold for military. So they'll be trying to take it as well, and in the south. Look, the overall motion here, thank you for the map. You can see the map, uh, the arrows going around us, and you can see Arlovka right in the middle of the map between two pincers. That's where they are planning to join, to connect. and. All that uh, in the south, Vadana, uh, they've been trying to storm that to create a platform in the future to encircle Avdivka, and now they're trying to work on that success. We'll see. Maybe they won't be successful in that motion, but I'm rather pessimistic, or rather say realistic, in my expectations. But overall, you can see their general ideation. They're running towards Arlovka. And in the north, they're running to Stipove and Berdici, and uh, that's where the pincers will close. And if you, you don't even need to be military, looking at the defense of that line, you can say that it'll be a difficult proposition to defend that area. And historically, the areas like that were not successful in being defended, despite of the quality of troops you have, because the only way out of that situation is to cut the pincers. See the green areas at the bottom? You'd need to cut and uh, cut the pincer between them, and then also do the same motion up top. And I don't think we have enough troops to do that maneuver. So the main point for us would be not to miss the moment when we need to withdraw troops. So how do we feel that? When do we know that it's the moment? Military personnel know, know that. They know when the time is good. But the main difficulty will be to agree on the political level to remove the PR and political component from that situation and uh, let military make a decision when it's the right time to move. Today, the uh, United States came out with a statement saying that they're ready for tactical losses in the next uh, several weeks on the front for Ukraine, basically hinting us at this eventuality. RT Green also talked about the situation with Terricon, and he was saying that there was no reason to hold Ukrainian troops in this locale, and they were held there till the last moment, so basically we were watching them being decimated life and destroyed life in that uh, area when it was taken by Russia. So it kind of indicates that our decisions are already not timely, or isn't it? You understand, Nikolai, how Red Army was set, which uh, actually still influences a lot of what we do in Ukraine and all the ex USSR republics. You could lose a battalion. You could lose battalion five or six times, and you'll get a battalion to command again. You may not succeed in your offensive, but it's very important that you actually exert enough effort to try and still succeed. But the moment you start to think and plan in the paradigm of saving your troops, in a paradigm of maneuvers and being more effective rather than blunt, 
This is uh, when you will be scolded. This is when you'll be punished. When Viktor Suvorov, a historian uh, from Russia, was uh, teaching in uh, NATO and in the United States and Britain on the difference of military use and military philosophy between NATO and Russia and Soviet Union, he was giving them a task. If you're a commander of a battalion, you have three companies and a reserve. And one company broke on the right, broke defense and went further. Another company was sent up front, got into the minefield and got hit by artillery and it's uh, struggling to proceed. The third company went on the left flank and got trapped and got attacked from air and it's basically gone now. You have a reserve company. Where are you sending it to? All smart, bright, absolutely dumb, moral, immoral officers of the Soviet school, of the Red Army school, would say that they would send additional support to the company that broke through. And they don't give a damn about those two other companies that are defeated. NATO officers do not, almost never speak about the first company. They talk always about second and third companies. And they usually send aid where the aid is needed. Red Army works differently and the, they have a different paradigm. They also are very sensitive about withdrawing and leaving different positions. It's almost on their genetic level, so they are, that's the way they are trained, so they are holding till the last person. And eventually the decision that uh, allows them to withdraw, political decision that comes from above, it usually is taken not timely, so that troop usually gets decimated. And sometimes situations exist when you do need to hold till the last man. For example, when while you're holding, the reserves are being formed to deblockade that part of the front. Or, for example, when we were holding Bakhmut and Solidar, we were forming strategic reserves for the future counteroffensive. Sometimes you need that other troop would maneuver and get to the right position while you're holding here, or wait for artillery to arrive to change the situation. But this situation always is limited by time and has a very clear, defined end goal. But when it's not defined, when it, there are no time frames, and uh, the main principle is just not a step back, then uh, the ghost of Stalin wakes up and starts to run the field. And this is uh, very far from our Ukrainian National Military School, which started to emerge in 2014, which is very effective in its own way. It combines the best ideas from NATO and from the Red Army, but we have not had enough time to switch completely to that style. There is still a lot of Red Army concept in the way we fight and a lot of attempts to use NATO styles, but they're not exactly clear for our commanders sometimes, because the, there is also a situation when one can observe that some of the commanders want to be liked by NATO, some follow NATO, some regulations like NATO does, but they're not too familiar with them. So you see an interesting hodgepodge of decisions being made. So I have another question here. Looking at what is unfolding near FDFK, I think it's right to say that Ukraine is switching to strategic defense, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. Let's remember a situation about a year ago, exactly a year ago, when Russians understood they are failing with their offensive campaign, where Kharkov part of the front collapsed, things near Kherson started to not go their way, and they organized and withdrew their troops from Kherson. This is an example of adequate, even given that Sorovikin, we can argue about his uh, professionalism, but he managed to withdraw a lot of professional forces from Kherson and to fortify at the new lines. So a year later, what are they doing? They're now going into their counteroffensive. It's uh, their turn. Now they have enough resources. So Ukraine needs to be flexible and continue looking at situation in that light. And the question with Avdiivka needs to be considered as a normal maneuver that occurs. Things like that happen at war. And when our leadership will stop grasping at the public opinion, which uh, it thinks that uh, it, will, it will be categorically against withdrawals, our task is to convince the government that actual public opinion doesn't is much calmer than they think. Because for public for our society, the life of a soldier is much more precious than that uh, piece of land. Yes, it is uh, poured with our blood, defending it, but we can always come back and take it back. Same as we see that Russians are trying to take back what we liberated last year. Let me quote Suvorov. He formulated that 
a couple hundred years ago rather successfully. With the loss of Moscow, Russia is not lost. But, and they were actually giving up the very symbolic city. Moscow was a capital, right? But with the loss of army, Russia is lost. Turning to our situation, with the loss of Avdiivka, Ukraine is not lost. With the loss of our army, we'll be losing much more than Avdiivka. So this is a very simple dilemma, but not a single time. When we ran into that, we followed through in the right fashion. And I can count those cases. Ilovaisk, the Baltsova. The Baltsova, we somehow withdrew at the last moment, but we're sitting there way too long. Papasne, Solidar, and now Avdiivka. Note that an absolute dumb by character and the external characteristics Suravikin, he actually turned out to be rather flexible to withdraw Russian troops near Kherson when it was time to do that. And he managed to even explain it to his political leadership why they needed to withdraw. And Russians have done it twice. They withdrew their troops from near Kiev, Kharkov and Sumy and Chernigov in the north, and then they did the same thing on the right bank of Kherson, of Don uh, near Kherson. Then why we, supposedly smart, cannot still grasp that maneuver that would save lives of our soldiers. It's good to have a live soldier instead of a dead hero. One more clarification here. Artie Green was also talking. I'll be relying since it was just a recent stream, so I'll be bringing examples. In Ukraine, it doesn't seem that we have an institute to punish the officers of the highest command for the losses and errors, and nobody is analyzing that. Even uh, the same meat storm actions, I don't know how proper it is to bring that. He actually says that it was rather popular in the Ukraine military too, and then it stopped, but nobody was really punished for exploiting that solution. Yeah, for the whole time of this war, I think only the ex-commander of the territorial defense, Igor Tensura, was removed and demoted, but that was for corruption scandal. But nobody was punished indeed for the losses. In Russia, I would remind, they are investigating six highest level officers and the lower level officers, they have uh, hundreds of cases in being investigated. In Ukraine, somehow we got a different formula that we cannot prosecute anybody on the military side. You cannot even criticize only people who wear military uniform and insignia. They have some leeway to criticize inefficiencies in uh, the military because otherwise you'll be attacked that you are a Russian spy or a Moscow stooge and only being a military yourself, you can actually criticize some things. But uh, everybody in the military knows that we have a ton of ineffective elements that need addressing. And if we don't start addressing them, we are not going to fight better. We have to start selecting the right cadre for the right decisions. All right, a new aid arrived to Ukraine from several centers, Minister of Defense of the United States also announced additional aid. It's related with air defense and HIMARS and javelins, etc., and uh, shells and bullets. So one way or another, there's additional aid coming to the front. Yeah, some people already came out and uh, called this package to be the smallest during all the times. It's only 150 million, but hey, we are glad to get anything. 150, that's what they had, that's what they gave. But the main accent in this package is for air defense systems and anti-tank systems. So the most widely used, which uh, play a big role on the front and is very important. So anti-tank, and usually it's controlled, it's guided weapons, air defense, anti-tank and such nomenclature, and thank you very much for sending it to us. Today, Zaluzhny had a meeting with two heads of uh, Joint Chief of Staff uh, and the, from the United States and also the leader from uh, Great Britain, military high, ranking, high ranks from Britain. Official reason is discussing the strategy for winter defense, but I think the main element would be a discussion what to do next when our counteroffensive did not achieve the goals, and Russia is now switching into counteroffensive mode, and they were discussing the flow and the maps of the winter campaign. So professionals understand that. As we see, it's more important for us as a society to come to grips with reality. War is a long event, it's protracted war. So if we withdraw today from one place, we'll come on back and take it tomorrow. 
there is no reason to cry over every piece of land that will not lead us in uh, any good place. We need to be calm and take these maneuvers calmly the way they happen, and often timely withdrawal becomes a good condition for the future victory, and usually is. If the army maintains its core, then it has more chances to win the war overall. But yeah, we need to be preserving our core cadre. The number of uh, cadre we burnt in defending Bakhmut, I would think there'll be a lot of uh, criminal investigation after. But uh, that's just my point of view. To the other front in this world, Israel and Hamas. The defense forces of Israel said that at the night of 26th, they sent some tanks and infantry into a raid on the North Ter Territory of Gaza. So it seems like the ground operation had started. The operation at large was postponed. The United States are asking Israel to postpone the operation. But regardless, this operation still starts, right? How do you see that? Nikolai, this is not a ground operation. This is one raid. Ground uh, operation is large and loud to hold the enemy's forces and to overwhelm them. What's the difference is that in the Lebanon war, when Israel did not want to fight Hezbollah en masse and was trying to respond to individual soldiers being captured by sending special companies of special forces to take them back. As a result, they lost a company of special forces, lost a few tanks and did not would not achieve their goals. And that lasted for about a month and a half until eventually they mobilized big numbers and they started succeeding. Because war, first of all, is the war of big numbers. The God is on the side of large battalions. That's an old saying. And when the ground campaign actually starts, you'll see. We'll, we'll all see that. This was a single raid, and I think it was part of the forming operations in order to be able to start the larger one. So one more question about the Israeli situation overall. Sevalet Zelenin, who was here maybe five minutes ago before our stream, he was bringing our situation as an example at the beginning of war and how it is being gauged by Israeli military colleagues, first of all. And they are saying that somehow in Israel they are losing all the information war unlike the Ukraine at the beginning of war, which uh, showed a very successful story of the information resistance to Russian attack. And why do you think is that? I'll be blunt, they did not have Aristovich in Israel. That's a very concluding answer. Do you want to add anything to that? No, no, that's it. It's not comfortable to praise oneself, but de facto, Indeed, Nikolai, Israel information component is somewhat slacking. It was the level of last century, and up to today they're losing that situation to Hamas. They indeed have a lot to learn from Ukraine and, frankly, from Hamas as well, because Hamas is playing very loud and very systemically on the media field. So that needs to be considered. All right, Ukraine is on the list of five countries with the worst taxation system. According to Tax Health Index 2023 from Foundation 1841, the analysis of American Fund determined that Ukraine has severe deficiencies in the taxation system, difficult logic of taxation, a high level of corruption, which basically led to Ukraine joining the club of the tax hell, select few. So I have a question. What else are they looking for? What exactly are they looking for when they compile these uh, interesting statements that uh, portray our amazing country in such a horrible light? Why don't they listen to International Monetary Fund, who is uh, singing asanas to Ukraine? You know, that describes the state of the information war a year and a half later from the beginning, when it's other specialists who are carrying it on their shoulders and the ones who were initially doing it are not, at least officially they're not. And 
some actions, they bring a lot of information on their shoulders. Some actions, you don't even need to comment. You can just smile and write one line that the action was so strong that it talks about itself. And according to the information warfare, information needs to provide uh, to support the real actions of people who are making decisions. But there are other situations when leading when leaders uh, do not, are not in a hurry to be effective, to make certain strong decisions, then the role of information component is to support the moral, the, the morale, the information component, and to just carry people over until the decision is made. But eventually this resource runs out. You can be triple genius in the information, but if there are no decisions being made to follow, you cannot carry it forever. Same as in uh, Inhabited Island by Strugatskis, when they were describing the principle of those uh, emitting towers that were zombifying people. The, they were saying that you can tell people, you can impress on them that they anything you want, but you still need to feed them, because you can only impress on the hungry person that he is not hungry only for a short while. After that, he'll just go mad from incongruence of reality and what he believes in. Same thing here. You can only feed informational component so far. After that, you need to start making actions. And when on the indexes of economic freedoms and uh, taxation, simplicity and taxation freedoms, it's difficult to deal with these points for any of the information people. You need at least to send an explanation why is that happening. Or perhaps your communication needs to be uh, carried like this. Indeed, we were acknowledged to be a tax hell, and we are on 123rd position in the world out of 200 countries. We are definitely in the lower half of it, and we need to explain it somehow. So then we would need to come out and say that, okay, friends, we were planning these reforms, but two waves of COVID and war precluded us from implementing these reforms. Right now, during the war times, it's very difficult to continue with that. And we understand your concerns because you are supporting us monetarily, but at the moment we cannot really do it. And the society then buckles and says, well, damn it, when are we going to have a good time? But at least they would understand what's going on. Our problem is that we don't even have that communication. If we are in the top five hellish tax escapes in the countries in the world, at least come out and explain why. But instead, we add this topic to some prohibited topics that are not to be discussed. That's speaking of the country that is fighting for freedom, right? I'll open you a serious uh, mystery here. Do you know how it looks from afar, how it is uh, seen by people who are busy with the professional information agenda in the world when they look at Ukraine? Do you know what they see? They are telling you look like the country that says that it's fighting for freedom, but in reality it's fighting for a change of sovereign, for a change of allegiance. And you are afraid to not be liked by new masters. Basically changing Moscow for Washington and Brussels. And you look like you are cowards who are cowardly enough to not even acknowledge that fact on the level of information communication. And that's kind of the behind-the-scenes conversations. And they're not even talking about freedoms, because how do you explain censorship? Men locked inside the country, economic not freedoms, informational lack of freedom, and unspoken order of taboo subjects, of plenty of taboo subjects that we cannot discuss about. For example, you cannot discuss about lack of freedom, about real image, why our economic position is the way it is you're immediately being attacked by a bunch of people here in Ukraine for being a baddie and working against Ukraine. So imagine you're going to see a doctor, you have a fourth stage cancer, and you're being told anything but true. Or, less dramatic example, if the tooth is falling apart and you go to a stomatologist and he's looking at that and saying, yeah, we can treat it, but we should not be telling him what's happening there. That's a bad proposition. And if we don't communicate with the world at large about economic problems, it can be read two ways. 
we're either doing it on purpose, we're holding people in economic hell, and that means that we are just villains, straightforward villains that need to be addressed, or we are unprofessional to the degree that when we are in a tragic, dramatic situation, we cannot even communicate properly what's going on. And I suggest our viewers to pick the right version. Please write in the commentary about all these, uh, under all these streams, actually four streams, I think, Alexei's channel, Alpha Media, Yuri Romanenko, and Privateer Station in English. And let us look at another, I would say, unique initiative by people's uh, congressmen. No, they did not decide to struggle to tackle the taxation hell. They decided to wrestle with Aristovich. 29 congressmen, led by Natalia Pipa, wrote a paper addressing Alexei Aristovich. There was another small one before, but now this one has 29 signatures. And it appears that Natalia Pipa and her compatriots are thinking that you made, you committed a crime when you accused her of committing a crime. I think you did it together with Yuri. Oh, Pipa? Yeah, that's about the boy who was detained in Lvov, and uh, he was detained for several days in a God knows where for him singing songs of Kino and Soy on the street. I would also add here, we actually reached out to one of the congressmen who, whose signature is on this uh, petition, because when we were there, he hugged Alexei and he uh, took selfies with him. So we reached out and said, hey, so what's that with incongruence? Why are you on this list of signatories under that document? Why are you thinking that Alexei should be reprimanded? And his answer was, oh, wait a sec, was it about Aristovich? I did not know. They just approached me and said that we need to continue kicking Russians and uh, you need to sign this petition. And I didn't really read it and signed. So that's according to his words. I suspect, and this was our little internal investigation that we did at hoc, that many of them signed this petition without really reading it. And there is another conclusion to be faced that all these people, Yaroslav Rushishan, Sergei Rahmanian, an ex-journalist very known, Karman Ladzinski, Yulia Klimenko, Mikhail Atsambaluk, Oleg Dunda, the one who, remember, at the conference, he had a, he was on Skype. So these people and mass they sign without really reading. And I suspect they write legal components for acting uh, legal action in this country and uh, all the documents they adopt in uh, Rada in the same fashion without really reading. You know, I'm going through the recent news. I can't remember any signi significant petition from congressmen about any case of corruption. There are hundreds, almost thousands of different cases now being prosecuted and reviewed by they keep mum about that. It seems that uh, it's more interesting for them to attack Aristovich rather. And Aristovich is probably more dangerous to Ukraine than corruption. Because the whole 29 congressmen are signing a petition because you were defending a miner who was singing a song in Russian. Yeah, let's take a look at this situation with the eyes of a foreigner who is monitoring information field in Ukraine. With last name Aristovich, there are two news in the media field. One of them is uh, Aristovich working on finding a way to de-block uh, the way for males to leave Ukraine and come back, and what terms, what conditions could it be done under, because it's a serious, serious pain point for the society. And the second one is that collective petition by congressmen attacking Aristovich for a situation that was uh, supposedly uh, done unjustly to a minor. So what do they see from afar? They see that Aristovich is trying to fix some things here and congressmen are attacking him. The case about that minor who was singing Tsoi is absolutely ridiculous. He is being illegally filmed without his permission, permission of his parents, being put online. Then he's being detained and captured somewhere by local police, nobody knows where, for several days. After that, they shame him publicly. They force him to record uh, an apology for making, frankly, no violations. So they make such a trashy case 
that looks like a huge uh, violation of human rights in the eyes of all normal people. So I start a case with police, local police, and it is not a topic of language, it's a topic of individual freedoms, especially individual freedoms of minors. And the violations were done by country bureaucrats, congressmen and police, in conditions of war, when the country is at war, which makes their crimes immediately, uh, escalates them to the heaviest degree. And by the way, to the honor of that people's deputy, the, the congressman, he actually wrote me separately and apologized for his signature, stating that he is withdrawing it and he didn't know. But the organizers of that petition, they are trying to initiate another criminal prosecution of myself because uh, supposedly I invented the reasons to attack them and I invented their violations. They don't know their own laws. The law they're referring to when pub punishing the minor, it actually was aimed at the performers who supported Moscow. There is even exclusion in that law for those who did not publicly support Putin's regime. So you can still play them out loud in, in public. And Tsoi and his music never supported Putin's regime. He actually died in 1990, a year before Soviet Union fell apart. So performing his songs does not violate this law. So our congressmen adopted this law, and now they're violating their own law. And now they're attacking a person who pointed at them and saying, indicated that they are violating their own legal acts. So this is what, 29 congressmen of a European parliament, okay, maybe nine, 20 perhaps were deceived. But what message are they sending to the congressmen of other countries? Same NATO and EU countries who can observe all that from the news uh, field. On the 7th of November, there'll be a Congress, European Union, Ukraine, discussing our readiness to join EU. There'll be a lot of hearings, etc. And I'm thinking, should I probably visit it, bring some journalists together and talk about European perspectives of Ukraine? On the example of a sample case of uh, some Aristovich fella, how will they gauge that situation and that prosecution of a minor by congressmen? And congressmen have a special status here in Ukraine, plus national police illegally using the law and perverting the meaning of that law and jailing the minor for something he did not commit. And then trying to criminally prosecute the person who indicated that they are committing this crime. Remember there was an episode when some executive head uh, of a region, regional executive had attacked the refugee who settled in a small village with a mom with kids. And uh, yeah, I also sent a request to police to investigate her and it's being investigated. Another ugly element was when some girls attacked uh, a cab driver for not speaking uh, Ukrainian when he was providing service. And that case really blew up and I'm trying to bring attention to that because it is discrimination. There are 45% of the nation agree that we have discrimination, actually, including others. No, 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 Alexei, 45, actually, I just double checked. It's uh, it, in, it just about the language, that 45% of our citizens feel the language pressure. Right, so they're now making a villain out of Aristovich. At the same time, 45% of our population thinks that they, we have that issue with language. And it's uh, it goes both ways. Ukrainian speaking, attacking Russian speakers, Russian speakers attacking Ukrainian speakers, and uh, that's what comprises these 45%. Normal powers during war and even in peace times would not allow in any fashion to play and to earn political points on language, national, religious, or any other components that are written into our constitution. But these things happen everywhere. 45%, half of roughly, of our populace are saying that we indeed have an issue. So how are we joining EU? And now all that in the backdrop of war. Right now in Odessa, they detain vessels that need to bring grain uh, to other countries, to buyers. Uh, an association of grain traders actually is starting a case 
because uh, they're losing millions of dollars for ships being detained, and they're supposedly, actually, they, they're suspecting that they're detained uh, for illegal bribes. And we have difficult situation of Divka. At the same time, people are trying to support their troops. They're gathering, like we're here, gathering funds to support our troops uh, monetarily for nails, for UAVs, for FPV drones, for other things. Ridiculous. And what do congressmen do while all that is unfolding? Right? They're running after Aristovich because he is pointing at their crimes. And Alexei, I want to introduce here, interject here. I'm just getting messages from friends who are asking for additional fundraising. Yeah, of course, Starlinks, FPV drones, quadrocopters, but nails. Number 10 and number 15, 100 kilos each. Five evacuation vehicles. And I'm asking the question, those 29 congressmen who found time to sign that petition without even looking to attack Aristovich, that they cannot prioritize important things in the country at war. Because while the whole country is volunteering and gathering all these things that are lacking at the front, you congressmen are just wasting your time, granted to you by your voters, and you waste it on some stupid stuff, instead of providing aid to our soldiers dying on the front, or providing protection from abuse to its citizens, because our government doesn't have enough wits to connect huge resources that it's now getting from the West to send them to the right points where they are needed instead of putting that in their pockets. What really tipped me was that Rahmaninov, who showed up on that list, who was a brilliant journalist. Yeah, he was, I think, I think he was a participant in the National Defense Committee. So that's where we may have tickled him. And I have a good question. What did their committee actually work on in the last year and a half? And if you shake our huge parliament and look for solutions, one will find that they have no solutions. Besides some slogans, most of them which are really awful, and attempts to reshape our constitution and human rights in this country. And that's it. That's the quality of the parliament we have. The government and is not reacting to a ton of problems that we have related to deaths of soldiers, to difficulties that civilians face. And what are they doing? They're trying to justify the crimes that they've done against a minor in Lvov, on public, on camera, many times. And they call it the fight for national security of Ukraine. I would say they're disrupting national security because these violations and mass supported by congressmen who are supposed to protect our constitution. This is what a disruption of our security of Ukraine. And who can give them the right judgment? Who are the colleagues in Congress who can voice a different position? Where is the Committee for the Freedom of Speech, which was headed by Shufrich up to recent times, but now that he is gone, somebody is still carrying the banner, right? Where are they? Where are the other branches of power? Well, of course, we'll make sure that judicial power does it right at the end, but it's a long process. So I'll just report the results at the end. I won't give you details as we go, but at the end, uh, I think we'll uh, surprise everybody pleasantly and we'll send the money gained from that to support our military. So yeah, everybody is keeping mum. Who can give a judgment to these congressmen? Speaking of the balance of powers and their responsibility in front of people. And you want that, that system of power to be adopted, or to be taken into EU, to be given a verdict that indeed you are supporting the values of European Union? Can you imagine uh, if 29 German congressmen or French congressmen would attack a blogger who is only bringing to light the violations of human rights? What would happen to these congressmen? French society or German society would have torn them apart and uh, their colleagues in Parliament would have already attacked them as well and tried to uh, straighten it out. And not just for the actions, but also for not knowing their own laws and provoking that situation to go deeper and peddling this crime that they committed further. So, which Europe are we going to, colleagues? And if that is happening on the backdrop of, drop of uh, French or German soldiers dying at the front somewhere, I can't even imagine how that would be seen in the media field. These congressmen would be 
but a smudge on the page of history after that. They would not be able to fix their reputation after. That would be the last thing they've done as a congressman. So that situation shows a distance between the level of our politics and the pretense that uh, we put up on our banners. Formal is joining EU and joining NATO. Informal, how fluffy and good we are. And the second, a huge abyss between the fighting war, society and power. The army is fighting, society is trying, doing its best to help the army, and these guys are basically causing us more harm and more damage in the media and the field of rights. Who, where and how can judge them, can evaluate their work? Let's do it here on the stream. We can, and let's suggest our society to also chime in and evaluate what they think about it. Guys, uh, let's also show how we are different from all these congressmen and close the fundraising for evacuation vehicle for 114th Brigade, 134th Battalion. I put a link now in the description to that video. It's an alpha media on my stream and on Alexei's stream. Out of 250,000 hryvnas, just think about it, 250,000 hryvnas people are raising to evacuate their wounded. They already collected a share of this amount, so we have about 160,000 hryvnas left. Side note from privateer station, current exchange rate is about 3 cents per hryvna, so right now they're raising about $7,000 for evacuation vehicle. This is a shame for our country that our government cannot fund evacuation vehicles and private citizens have to do the fundraising for that. By the way, Yuri, with uh, our recent collection, remember we raised the funds yesterday for the drones? So I had a funny uh, comment. The guys who were asking for this money, we transferred them, them the money. They today went to purchase the drone and they actually went to the store. So the store owner, the, where they could get one, is uh, smoking there and telling them, imagine I saw yesterday that Aristovich was also raising with his friends some money, but they're probably stealing everything. I actually wanted to pitch in, but I had a friend who told me, don't, because everything is being stolen. So these guys are actually showing that here, these are the money that they raised. They just transferred them to us and we're here to buy them. So he was very impressed. And then they also went further. They actually showed how much Alexei personally transferred to their account. He found it hard to believe. But I actually just wanted to make a side note here that we are gathering these funds to the cards of our detachments that have cards to pay for their expenses. We are gathering funds into these cards so they can pay everything directly and we don't even touch this money. So please, everybody, let's support that. Evacuation vehicles are saved lives of our soldiers. Two other news. The head of foreign affairs of Hungary on the conference in Belarus remarked uh, about two priorities that he sees in order to avoid a big war in Europe to cease war, to stop this war, and to restore civilized conversation between West and East. Together with that, Minister of Slovakia, Robert Fico, made a statement that Zelensky's peace plan is not realistic and Slovakia is not going to support EU sanctions against Russia without analyzing its influence on the internal situation in Slovakia. So it seems like all these new parties who won on the Russian side with these uh, countries are attacking Zelensky's peace plan and they're coming out of the woodworks saying and showing their allegiance and are saying that we need to strike peace accords with Russia. In our previous stream we did talk that we need to talk to these countries, to their parties in power. Urban made a statement after our last stream, I don't think it's connected, but it just coincided time ways that Ukraine should come to Hungary and talk to Orban to discuss about uh, the actions about the monies being frozen from Europe for Ukraine by Hungary. So my question is, do we need to understand them in these theses? Yes, Nikolai, we still need to conduct this work because wherever we are not present, we cannot win. If we are not talking to them on their platforms, we are not winning. And if you make one step backwards or even two steps backwards outside of this framework to the overall position of FITS and uh, the ruling party in Hungary, they became much more excited after Putin's visit to China. 
We are observing some sort of explosion of different statements from them, almost to the level of Urban actually comparing Brussels with Moscow that was throwing tanks into Hungary when they had an uprising against Soviet Union. And uh, his Minister of Foreign Affairs is visiting Belarus, who, who is participating under Lukashenko in the military aggression against Ukraine. We do separate Belarus people and Lukashenko regime, but on the formal level, for the member of uh, NATO and EU, Belarus is not the best visit to discuss peace plans. So they're dropping off all of their shyness and are talking with the words of Russian propagandists, Hungarians and the ruling party in Hungary and the ruling party in Slovakia. I would say something happened in China, and that's rather interesting. Biden also made his statements about New World Order and the fight and the struggle between dictatorships and democracies when Putin was in China, probably agreeing to something with Xi. And today there was news that North Korea supplied 350,000 shells already to Russia, while EU is not going to fulfill 1 million shells that they planned. They barely will uh, hold 300,000 for this year due to production capacities. And North Korea would not supply anything without Chinese input. So I think China has made its mind. Guys, sorry for intervening. In eight minutes, we gathered the balance of about $4,000 equivalent to that card. So we're closed. we closed that uh, fundraiser request for the evacuation vehicles. Tomorrow we'll have another fundraiser or whenever we come live next time. But this is the real power of people, of volunteers and people supporting their freedom and their country. Thank you, dear audience. Thank you, Alexei, your viewers and Alpha Media. Please do not send more money. Uh, this card is good enough. We're taking it offline. And I want to also comment here, Yuri. Our order would be as follows for fundraising. We are bringing requests. Please bring up uh, the fundraising request to us. So first we check the reality. How real are these requests? Are these real detachments, real military detachments that want to address our streams? Please send uh, letters to us. Please leave your messages with phone numbers and points of contact so our people can verify that you are for real. And then within a day or two, we bring it to the next stream and we do the fundraising. So it literally takes us about a day or two to verify all we need to verify and then we can proceed. And thank you, huge thank you to our viewers who close these uh, critical fundraisers in just about 10 minutes. Yuri interrupted you there a little bit. Are you finished with answering the previous question? Yes, my message was we need to be everywhere and talk to everybody because everything can be won only in a concrete debate with a concrete arguments where we need to try to understand them and try to bring our point of view and our issues to them. This is the only way we can succeed. And all the changes they aggregate gradually, but they manifest rapidly. And even in Hungary, this is just a ruling party. President and the population think different. Same in Slovakia. So we need to make sure that we do not just rely on statements of our foreign affairs with all my respect to the, them and their work. It's just them. We need to also all chime in and participate in these conversations. From United States, Mike Johnson was selected as the Speaker of Congress. What is he known for? He's a pro-Trump rather conservative congressman. He actually was uh, speaking against aid to Ukraine, but right after being appointed, he said that he has nothing against supporting Ukraine. Nikolai, their position sounds a little different. In America, everything is very precise. He was never considered to be anti-Ukrainian. He was very conservative in regards to spending American money, the money of American taxpayers. So he was not bluntly against funding Ukraine but he was insisting that we need to verify how these monies are spent. We need to be conservative in how we spend the money of our taxpayers. When we have so many internal problems, this is one of the main slogans of Trump and his uh, surroundings and his uh, supporters. 
and anti-Ukrainian statements that Ukraine is bad and uh, it shouldn't be supported, just like Orban says, he never afforded himself these statements. And one needs to understand, the moment politician becomes appointed, becomes a representative of a bigger group, he changes his tune because he now needs to represent different forces, different parties. And now he says that, of course, let's uh, control things to a higher degree, but we're not against of supporting Ukraine. He was basically, how to translate that, he was for a, a very detailed audit and control of American money going to Ukraine, which is good. And he even said, now I'm ready to discuss the aid that we're sending. Let's address that. Let's address that in sessions and review where we send money to and is it effective. That shows once again that arguments work, that debates work. His colleagues explained to him and not only that there are different things, different factors, let's divide aid to Ukraine in the face of it turning completely into one big bucha and of course a valid concern of uh, spending American taxpayers' money effectively. So let's uh, reinforce the controlling function, but we should not completely stifle the support because there will be lives of people on the back end of it. And if we don't do, that will be American soldiers stopping Putin sooner or later. Pashinyan in Armenia started the public process of expelling Russian troops from Armenia. He uh, stated publicly that there are no advantages to hosting Russian troops in Armenia. That led us to a decision that we need to diversify our investments in terms of security. So Armenia is looking for new allies, and uh, they make a public statement about that. And a related question, a simple one, how and what way Russian troops would have to leave Armenia after all these statements? Well, if he denounces his participation in CSTO and 102nd base in Gimri, and how many Russians are based there, then Parliament of Armenia can vote, it's a parliamentary decision, about presence of foreign bases on the territory of the country, the same way they continued Kharkov agreement about prolonging Russian presence there. And then later the government can find ways to do it. But since Armenia is a parliament, parliamentary republic, not so much a presidential republic, but uh, he's of the same coalition, so they can address that and they can change situation. He is basically thoroughly removing the force that both brought Armenia into a dead end and also is attacking him personally. And he actually destroyed the Karabakh clan, pro-Putin clan, to such a degree that many of them chose to surrender to Azerbaijan instead of coming back to Armenia to face the court system there. And Armenia has now good relations with some neighbors. Also, there are bigger countries, France, Greece, United States, not the last countries in this world that might lend a hand, and he probably got some guarantees or figured out a plan that he can lead Armenia in a stable fashion through a very narrow pathway and get rid of Russian influence in that area. All right, one more interesting moment, I think we need to comment on this, because people are writing a lot in uh, to personal messages. General SVO, rather well-known uh, channel, Telegram channel in Russia, that often leak a lot of interesting things. Right now they're putting that, they, they posted that Putin has died in his residence in Valdai at 10 p.m. Moscow time, roughly. Doctors uh, stopped resuscitation efforts and now they're blocked in the presidential apartments there. And I'm just reading that and remembering the movie about death of Stalin. And security service uh, representatives are holding doctors. And the Secretary of uh, Security of Russia, Patrushev, is leading that situation. And by the way, a uh, side note that if they will not come out and publicly declare uh, the truth, that will be equal to the country turnover to a military coup. So what do you say, Alexei? Well, it's interesting. This channel can post things like that and then they either will save their reputation or they'll just be added to a trash bin of uh, fake news. 
So if Putin is not dead next morning, then we probably will say that this channel was not correct and shouldn't be taken seriously. If Putin is indeed dead, I guess we all will be celebrating. But let's see, and I don't think they actually are guessing right in this case. Let's see. You know, it's 50-50. He's either dead or not, just like a dinosaur, pink dinosaur. He'll either come from behind the corner or not. Exactly. All right. And one more news we wanted to bring up today is uh, news from Russia, delegation of Hamas with uh, the leader of their political bureau movement came to Moscow. Minister of Foreign Affairs in Russia confirmed that. Previously, that head of uh, political affairs of Hamas was asked to leave Turkey because there was a video posted in social media where he is praising God for what was happened on the 7th of October. So he was uh, gently asked to remove himself from Turkey and now he visited Russia. Seems like this person is not needed anywhere in the world except for Moscow and supposedly is being received with the delegation from Hamas. Turkey technically is complementary to Hamas. Erdogan even said that they do not consider Hamas a terrorist organization, but even for them it's uh, difficult to host these guys. I don't know, Putin is a different character and I wonder if he supposedly died because of this, because hosting these monsters who are assassinating civilians in the fashion that Hamas did, invite them to the official uh, Kremlin and shake hands. I think this is a crime not only against human laws, but also against God's laws. So if uh, that channel, SVO General, turns out to be right, it'll be very symbolic that if Putin uh, gave his soul to God, or actually uh, I'm questioning where, did his soul, where would his soul go at the time of accepting Hamas delegation. At this moment, we would have to believe that some Kabbal, Kabbal uh, followers from uh, Israel were actually strong enough. But if to put um, all jokes aside, Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs sent a note, public note to Russia protesting Hamas reception, and even immigrants from Russia who are living in Israel, many of them are fighting in Israel army. Uh, and were involved in dispelling that attack by Hamas. We're still yet to to learn a lot about the atrocities they accomplished during those several days, uh, the Hamas attackers on the Israeli civilians. So when we see again this uh, demon accepting these cannibals and murderers in Moscow, I don't know how far can one needs one to fall to believe all that and to shake hands with murderers. And here's a good time to ask a question to Fitz and Urban. Okay, you support Putin. Now, do you support Putin shaking hands with Hamas? What is our embassy doing in Hungary and Slovakia? We should be rather active there right now, inviting local press and ask a public question of Fitz and Urban leadership. What's their position about Hamas' visit to Moscow? And catch them right there. That would be a good communicative policy, a good communication strategy. Communication needs to be attacking. Defense is a death of a revolt or a change of powers, I guess. So our only solution, our only pathway forward is to be active in the media front as well. Thank you, gentlemen, for being so active tonight, for uh, discussing all these news. Thank you again, everybody who helped us. We collected 205,000 hryvnias in about eight minutes. Tomorrow we'll have another stream with Alexei at 5 p.m., a more philosophic aspect of it, the one that's usually on Fridays. So come in, private air station, we'll try to translate. Have a good night.